There's good debt and there's bad debt. Even though you're living in the house, the house could still be an investment for you. It's good debt because it's making you money. Good debt makes you money. Bad debt takes it away. (laughs) Okay, so let's say that you want to buy $200,000 worth of stock. Pick a stock you like. Okay, let's say Apple stock. You want to buy $200,000 worth of Apple stock. How much money do you need? It's not a trick question. The answer is $200,000. Like back in the day, you even needed a little more because there was broker fees. But now let's say that instead of investing in in stocks, you want to invest in real estate. How much money do you need? Now, potentially, this is a trick question because if you're going to live in the house, you can get away with as little as $7,000 down payment, 3.5%. It's a thing, believe me. So that's just one of the many reasons why real estate is so amazing, why I love, love, love real estate as an investment. But now you're going to say to me, but Chris, now I have, if I put $7,000 down on this $200,000 house, now I have $193,000 worth of debt. Yeah, okay. So debt is an ugly word. Who wants debt? I mean, but if you've ever read anything from like, for example, Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, there's good debt and there's bad debt. Even though you're living in the house, the house could still be an investment for you. It's good debt because it's helping you to, it's making you money. Good debt makes you money. Bad debt takes it away. (laughs) So in this example, you've bought your $200,000 worth of real estate for only $7,000. And in this episode of Women Creating Wealth, we're going to talk about why not all debt is bad debt. And why I think real estate is superior to many other types, I think all other types of investing. My friend Anne Marie was working for Air Canada as the desk person, you know, like everybody who's missing their flights and all this stuff, they're all coming to her to yell and scream and complain. And because of that and lots of other reasons, she wasn't really loving her job all that much, but did not see a lot of opportunity to do anything else because she needed the money. She had been renting a house for 10 years and driving a little Ford Escort wagon. And, you know, I mean, not the happiest person in the world, but in general, a a happy person. Anne-Marie's dad had left her some stock when he passed away, and she'd just been sitting on it, not really sure what to do with it, because it didn't feel like that much money to her. And then um, she started, you know, we started talking about some stuff. She realized that she actually had enough to buy an investment property. And also, it was going to be a place for her to live. So we started looking. We found her a three-family house. She was going to live in the middle unit and rent out the top and bottom. Now, just to give you some perspective on this, this whole investment, the down payment on the house, and this is in Boston where real estate was, even then, was quite expensive. The property cost almost $500,000. And still, she was able to put 3% down and still have some money left over to do some fix up of the place that she had wanted to do. So you have to picture Emery. She's about five foot one. So that's. (laughs) <laughs> she's about five foot one. She's not particularly like strong person. She's not scary. <laughs> and and she's thinking to she's getting herself into a situation where she's going to be, she's got one tenant on the third floor who's been living there for 17 years, doesn't speak a word of English. And she's got a first thing right out of the gate, she's gonna raise their rent. And then the person downstairs who I, personally, I was intimidated by like single mom, like six foot high sons and, you know, dogs and people and, you know, pit bulls and the whole thing. And I'm just like, really? But she knew, and this is a hundred percent mindset, which is what gets you to where you want to be is a great mindset. We're going to talk about that later, but she felt she could do it. She knew she could do it. And in fact, she did it. And now fast forward about six years, she's on that property and it is almost doubled in value. And the rest of the money, so she took some of the money from the stocks and she kept the rest. And the majority of that money that she had in the stock market is, is gone. I mean, she just used it for bills. It was just, it's such a small amount. She thought, oh, I'll just, you know, I've got to pay my son's psychiatrist bill. I've got to pay my, you know, whatever, my taxes. And it just kind of frittered away. So the property doubled in value, but her actual investment, I mean, think about it. Her investment of about $20,000 has now added $500,000 to her overall wealth. That doesn't talk about the tax advantages. That doesn't talk about any of the other stuff that is going into this. Just think about 
taking $20,000 in the course of six years, making $500,000 with that money. That is the power of real estate. And that's why I think it's so great. So that property, because it's a three family property, when she first bought the home, the two tenants above and below were almost 100% paying the mortgage. So she went from paying almost $2,000 a month in rent to now paying about $140 for her mortgage. Over the years, the rents have gone up. Every year, she, she, she raises the rents a little bit. So now the property pays her complete mortgage, plus it pays the lease on her Mercedes. So she's no longer driving around in her little gray Ford Escort wagon. She's now driving around in its beautiful white Mercedes sedan. And she is like the happiest little person that you've ever seen. Not only that, Air Canada, she gave them the boot. They offered, they had an opportunity where they offered her uh, early retirement. And she was like, yes, please. So now she's just doing her thing. Went back to school to get her um, kitchen and bath certificate. She's doing kitchen and bath design, getting her architecture certificate. She just having a great time and doing stuff that she just loves, things that she loves. And the heck with getting up every morning. As she used to have to be at work at 5.30 in the morning. Getting up at 4.30 so you can get to work, so you can have people scream at you all day because they missed their flight. There's no more of that in her life. <laughs> when Emory and I first started talking about the idea of her buying a property, she was like, I don't want to go into debt. You know, my car's paid for, my, you know, my rent, whatever. I, I don't want to have this huge debt. And it is a big debt, right? She was buying a $500,000 piece of property with basically $20,000. <laughs> like $480,000 worth of debt. Oh my God, what happens? And of course, as all these scenarios go through your mind, what if everybody moves out? What if all my tenants move out? What if I lose my job? What if, you know, what if, what if, what if, what if? And one by one, we were able to address these issues because she was already paying a lot of rent. And so we said, how much is your mortgage going to end up being? And in fact, her mortgage, even if she didn't pay, even if she didn't have any tenants, her mortgage was about the same as her rent. So already a comfort level there. If you've ever read, so there's this book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. And that was one of the things that helped me to kind of change my own kind of paradigm about debt. There is such a thing as good debt. Good debt is a debt that helps you to do other things. So like credit card debt, you know, Probably not a great thing. Let's let, let's say that I get I have a ten thousand dollars on my credit card and I'm paying twenty five percent interest. You know, you think, well, that's a terrible thing. But if I use that ten thousand dollars to buy something that's making me money, let's say that I use that ten thousand dollars to buy something that I'm selling on YouTube for you know double the, the money. So that's the way you should think about it when you're talking about real estate investing, because that debt that you're going into is going to facilitate the kinds of huge gains that Amory saw in her three family house. Good debt is debt that puts money in your pocket. Bad debt is debt that just every month takes it away, right? So let's say that I went into debt to buy stock, right? I borrowed money and I went into debt to buy stock. If I borrowed $10,000 and I bought $10,000 worth of stock, then yeah, I mean if it goes up, great. If it goes down, you know, I'm kind of screwed because I can't even pay back the money that I borrowed. When you use debt to buy real estate, in general, especially investment real estate that's going to be paying the loan for you, which is one of the big things, right? That real estate is like a guaranteed savings account and your tenants are the ones that are putting the money into the savings account. When you're using debt to buy real estate, we call that leverage. So you're able to take something small, like the $20,000 that Anne Marie invested it, and use it to, to leverage something large, a $500,000 piece of property. That's the kind of power that you're not going to find by, you know, charging a pair of pants at Macy's, okay? <laughs> That's, it's a whole nother ball game. So yes, you know, buying a pair of pants that you can't afford at Macy's is not a great thing, but buying a piece of property that's going to allow you to get out of the cycle of renting or that's going to allow you to create a passive income stream, plus real estate historically over time has always appreciated. So, I mean, my parents paid, I want to say, I think it was like $7,000 for their first house. That same exact house is now worth $350,000. Now, granted, it's like 50 years later, but it's not worth $2,000, right? Which is can't be said for all the stock that I've purchased in my lifetime. <laughs> it's really important if you're thinking about becoming a real estate investor or, you know, thinking of 
of any type of investment that you have a good feeling for what is your comfort level for debt and risk and things like that. So with Anne Marie, we figured out that her mortgage was going to be about the same as her current rent. So she knew that even if everybody was gone out of that house, that she was going to be able to pay the mortgage. I mean, she might not be happy about it, but she was going to, she wasn't going to lose the house. She wasn't in danger of losing the house. And you want to be in that same situation where you know and you feel comfortable that you have a plan for what's going to happen. Like what's the worst thing that could happen and how am I going to deal with that? So let's say that I buy this property and suddenly, even though it had tenants in it, suddenly everybody moves out. What's going to happen then? What am I going to do? What what are my options? What can I do so that I don't lose this property to the bank? And there are lots of different alternatives, lots of different ways to buy real estate, including leveraging the real estate that you already own and turning that into a rental property. And we can talk about that uh, probably in a future episode, but um, that's what I did with my house. I bought myself a 1,200 square foot ranch, not a huge house, but it's just me. So I divided the house in half. One piece of property, one mortgage that I was already paying, I divided the house in half, turned it into two units legally with the town. And basically by doing that and, and making that an income property instead of just a house, I figured out for my initial investment, and I put down more than I needed to, I put down $60,000 and my profit, after I paid back the mortgage and everything else, my profit was over eight times that amount. So that's really good. <laughs> that's really good. You are not, most likely, unless you're really, really lucky, you are not going to buy a stock and turn around and make 800% increase on your investment. And you're probably not gonna buy anything else either and be able to get that kind of return. One of the things that we ran into with Anne Marie is she said, you know, look, this house is gonna need things. It's a big house, it's got a roof and you know, lots of things. I can't pick up the phone and call the landlord every time a light bulb goes out. What am I gonna do? And so we spent a lot of time to build the team for her to make sure that she had a really reliable carpenter and a really reliable contractor. And she knew who to call if something happened to the heating system or, you know, we, we had that, that those people in the Rolodex, who are you going to call? Who are you going to call? Yeah. Right. The Ghostbuster list. You need to know that you've got people who you can trust, who know what they're doing and who respect you. That's a really big thing that these people respect you. They're not going to condescend to you. They're not going to talk down to you. If you tell them you have a problem, they know that you actually have a problem because they know that you, they respect you and they know that you know your stuff. So how do you create that great list, that great Google sheet of people who you know that when you call them, they're going to pick up the phone, they're going to know what they're talking about, and they're going to come over and take care of whatever the problem is? I find that referrals is a great way. Certainly, you want to leverage whoever helped you buy the house because most real estate agents, they know tons of professionals. They often have to get involved with fixing stuff before things can go on the market, for example, or fixing things before people can move in and get involved in development projects. So your real estate agent is a fantastic resource. You can also, sometimes a home inspector can give you some ideas of people to call. Um, if you've got community groups, stuff like that. Ask your neighbors. It's really not as difficult as you might think to find a really great team of people. But then once you get them, you just want to stay in contact with them. Even if you're not going to have a plumbing problem this year, just give the person a call, send them a note, you know, whatever, just make sure that you're still on their radar so that make sure they're still in business <laughs> so that when you call them or when your tenants need them, that they're going to be available. But there are a lot of ways to invest in real estate and to make money in real estate that don't involve even knowing a plumber, <laughs> that don't involve ever seeing a person with a hammer in front of you. And we're going to be talking to all kinds of women who are doing ex all different kinds of real estate investing, from syndication to Airbnb home shares to one person who I want to in introduce you to, I'm looking forward to introducing you to, has opened up her home to people who are, are elderly. So she's created like her own little elderly community, and she's making a ton of money doing that, helping people um, as they age. There are so many different ways. There are hard money lenders. There are there's so many different ways to make money in real estate. And you are going to be introduced to all kinds of women who are really rocking it and who are many cases just like you, who were a little bit intimidated, a little bit afraid, a little bit uncertain, a little bit of, can I really do this thing? And then once they got going, it just took on a life of its own. 
So I think you're going to really enjoy meeting them.